Okay, so I'm very pleased to introduce for our second lecture course by Tim Dokchitzer. And uh, he's going to tell us about the inverse Galois problem. And Tim has set up a very nice homepage for his course, which is in the chat. And maybe I'll just repost it for people who came in late. Um, I'll, I'll repost it in a moment. And okay, thank you, Tim. Thank you very much. So yes, uh, I put it also here on a slide, uh, on the first slide, the link to the homepage, and this is where I'll try to keep everything. So uh, there will be exercises, so things which I do know how to solve, but they should be instructive. Uh, there's quite a few research problems, which are things I don't know how to solve, but I think they're interesting questions. Uh, then, uh, and there will be lecture notes, links to the videos and things like this. And most importantly, uh, a magma package for working with families of uh, Galois groups because I really hope that um, during this week you will have opportunity not just to learn the theory, but what Henrik referred to in his last lecture as pressing buttons. So, uh, and have an opportunity to actually construct uh, families of Galois groups and um, see how you can work with them. Uh, all right, uh, and there will be also problem sessions and the teaching assistant for this course is uh, Shiva. Uh, so please, uh, um, I'm sure you'll see him in, in the problem sessions, and we shall also try to drop by too. All right, so let me start by just uh, reviewing a bit of background from uh, Galois theory. So uh, let's start with the field uh, little k, which I will not probably use very much starting from the second lecture because it will always be a q or q of t. For now, let's think of the rational numbers. This is where uh, the problems um, that we want to talk about is most interesting. So uh, little k bar would be its algebraic closure. Uh, and suppose you've got, a you've got yourself a polynomial in kx of some uh, positive degree d. Uh, let's look at its roots alpha 1, alpha d in the k bar. Uh, and uh, in what I'm going to say, all polynomials are always assumed separable. So in other words, uh, all these roots are going to be distinct, as I'm sure you've seen before. This is just equivalent, if you want, from on the explicit side. Uh, to f having a co-prime, um, uh, being co-prime to its derivative. Uh, but it doesn't have to be reducible, uh, just any, uh, any polynomial. And we're interested in its Galois group. So uh, recall from Galois theory that you can construct uh, what I'll call capital K to be uh, the field which you get by joining to little k the roots alpha 1 to alpha d. So this is a larger finite extension of k. And this is a finite Galois extension. So it's Galois because, well, you can, see, you can see it's finite. It's normal because I'm joining all the roots uh, and it's separable by, uh, essentially by my assumption here. So it has a Galois group, so, uh, which I'll also de always denote by G. So G will be the Galois group of capital K over small k, which is defined as a set of automorphisms of capital K uh, over small k. So these are uh, automorphisms of K, which uh, live little k uh, point-wise fixed, and this is a finite group uh, whose degree, uh, whose, whose order is the, uh, the degree of this extension here. And um, if you want to think in terms of polynomials and their roots, well, uh, what you uh, get from this construction as a Galois group of a polynomial, uh, you get a bit more than an abstract group because it comes this Galois group here comes with a natural uh, permutation action on these roots. So recall that if alpha is the root of um, your polynomial f, and then you hit it by an automorphism, then you get again uh, another root. So the Galois group acts as permutations you know, of alpha 1, alpha d. It acts faithfully, so only identity can fix all these roots, um, pretty much by definition uh, of, of capital K. So in other words, what you find is that this uh, group G uh, acts uh, on the set alpha 1, uh, alpha d by permutations. In other words, it can be viewed naturally as a subgroup of the symmetric group SD. So uh, I will try to reserve the letter d for the degree of the polynomial. So my symmetric groups, they will be SD uh, and so the degree of little f, that's, um, that's this little d here. So, uh, so g is naturally a subgroup of the symmetric group SD. Uh, and if you, uh, I mean, of course, I picked a completely arbitrary order of these roots alpha 1, alpha d. I just said, well, let's look at all the roots. There's d of them because the polynomial is separable in k bar. Let's order them in some way. If you order them in a different way, uh, then uh, this reordering 
is a uh, is an element of SD if you want. Uh, and what you find what you find is that the image of G in SD, uh, if you reorder the roots, it just changes by conjugation. So this connotation of the roots just conjugates this G to another uh, subgroup of SD. So if you uh, want to forget about the ordering and define some sort of a canonical, uh, slightly more canonical object, then uh, what we are saying is that uh, to a polynomial uh, of degree D, we've associated uh, a conjugacy class um, of subgroups, or if you want to a subgroup in SD up to conjugation. Uh, and this group is what's called transitive. Uh, so in other words, it has only one orbit on alpha one alpha D. So remember it's some permutation group on D points. So it, it can have a bunch of orbits, but you can immediately see that if you've got an orbit, then grouping these roots together will give you a polynomial, which by Galois theory, again, has coefficients in the ground field. So orbits, they correspond to irreducible factors of F over the original field K. So it's an easy exercise to see uh, really uh, that, this is, that this is the case. And in particular, uh, what we um, want to observe is that uh, G is transitive. In other words, it has only one orbit on alpha one up to alpha D, if and only if F is irreducible. And very often people, even though it's not always convenient, try to restrict themselves to just considering irreducible polynomials and their Galois groups. As you will see in a second, this is not really a loss of generality. So from an explicit point of view, uh, this is sort of nice because transitive subgroups of SD, they have been classified, or in other words, enumerated if you want, and listed and stored in a database for all uh, reasonably size D. And at the moment, uh, the database in, I think, GAP and MAGMA, it goes up to D48. So for each uh, degree up to 48, uh, there is a complete list of transitive subgroups of SD up to conjugation. In other words, if you, uh, and they're numbered. So for instance, if you look at um, transitive groups acting on two points, there's only one cyclic group of order two. If you look at transitive groups acting on three points, there's two of them, cyclic group of order three and the full symmetric group S3. And if you look at, for example, of transitive group of order four, again, up to conjugation in S4, there's five of them, C4, C2 squared, D4, A4, and S4. Uh, and these numbers do grow, especially for certain degrees. So for instance, for uh, that's as far as the classification goes, the degree 48, there's about 195 million of them. But nevertheless, if you ask, for instance, MAGMA, what's a transitive group of 48 comma, I don't know, whatever number between one and 195 million, it will give you a specific transitive permutation group. And conversely, if you give it a transitive permutation group, it will return for you uh, the 48 uh, and the index. So in other words, if you want to think of, uh, if you want to say that uh, this specific irreducible polynomial has this Galois group, then to quantify this, it's quite nice to go by transitive subgroups of SD because it encodes not just the abstract group, but if you want how it acts on the roots by permutations. You see if there's any questions in the chat, let me just open it. So do feel free to uh, drop by questions in the chat and I'll, uh, I'll try to pay attention to it. So, uh, okay, now this does cover every finite group. So every finite group G is a transitive group of some SD. Uh, so how do you see that? Well, one way to see this, and essentially the only one, the only way to see it, is to say that, well, every group uh, acts uh, on itself by left multiplication. So if you take the set uh, to be uh, the group itself and let, uh, let G act on itself by left multiplication, that gives you an action um, which is called a regular action, uh, and it is transitive because if you multiply by an element of G, you do hit every element. So this has only one orbit. Uh, and therefore every uh, finite group G is a transitive subgroup of SD for, uh, for some D, namely D equals to its order. Now see there's a question in the chat, uh, list of transitive subgroups. Yes, so they're classified up to conjugation in SD. That's a little bit different than isomorphism and I'll give you an example in a second. Uh, and does it mean that there's this number of groups of 48? No. So um, if you look at these groups, for example, so there's a difference between the order of the group and the number of points on which it acts. So if you look at, for example, 
with groups of degree four, so my D is equal to four. In other words, if you're interested in Galois groups of polynomials of degree four, the largest group that you can have is a group of four factorial, is a group of size four factorial, and the smallest group you can have uh, is, a, is of size four. You can't have a transitive group of smaller order than that. So uh, what it says is that if you look inside S48, which is a huge group of order 48 factorial, there's this number of groups in it, and their order varies between 48 and 48 factorial. This is presumably C48, although I didn't check, and this is S48, the full symmetric group of 48 letters. And there's loads and loads of groups in between uh, that act transitively, like these ones, the sort of baby example of degree four, but uh, sort of on a much larger scale. Uh, okay, so now this difference, uh, which you kind of allude to in the question between uh, groups, uh, sort of between going by order and going by uh, this transitive degree, these two classifications are a little bit different. So for instance, every, uh, so most finite groups, they will occur several times in this list here. In other words, they can act on different, uh, they occur as different transitive groups. So in other words, most groups G, they have several different transitive actions. So let me uh, look why this is the case. So um, um, there is a little result that says that, uh, in, in group theory that says that if you're interested in transitive actions of any finite group, uh, G, then uh, they're in one-to-one -one correspondence to uh, conjugacy classes of subgroups H and G. And the correspondence is very simple. Uh, if you take a subgroup H and G, you can look at the cosets G uh, over H, or just left cosets, G acts on them. So that gives you a set of G, uh, a set with the G action, not necessarily faithful, but nevertheless a set um, with the G action. And conversely, if you start with any transitive G set, so in other words, any set of points on which G acts transitively, then you can pick a point, look at a stabilizer of that point in G, and that a stabilizer is going to be a subgroup of G, let's call it H. And if you pick a different point, you get a conjugate subgroup because they are all uh, permuted, the action is transitive. You'll see that you, you spend the whole conjugate class of, of subgroups like that. And this sets up this one-to-one -one correspondence. Uh, so if you want, and this is what we're looking at, we're looking at not just, so uh, a transitive action of G is a homomorphism from G to SD, uh, such that the image is a transitive group. What we're looking for, we're looking at inclusions of G into SD. Uh, in other words, we're looking at faithful actions. Uh, and for that, what we need is we need this action to be faithful. We don't want any element to act trivially. On, uh, on this left cosets. And if you think a little bit about it, uh, this corresponds to the fact that this subgroup here uh, is what's called core free. So it has a trivial core, where a core of a subgroup uh, is uh, defined as an intersection of all conjugates of that subgroup. So you take a subgroup H and G, and if you look at all of its conjugates and you intersect them, if you get the trivial uh, group, then so this is good, and then this is called a uh, subgroup with trivial core, and these are the ones which correspond to transitive faithful actions. Uh, let me just see if I didn't miss anything. Uh, let me just see where am I? Where am, where am I? I think she's keyboard because my mouse just jumps. Uh, okay, so uh, all right. So what I was trying to say. Uh, so let's uh, let me give you an example of this. So for instance, let's take the symmetric group on three letters G equals S three. Now I'm sure you know what its subgroups are. Uh, there is a trivial subgroup. There's a whole group. There is a normal C three, and there are three C twos which are generated by different transpositions, uh, and oh, these are all conjugate. So as far as uh, subgroups up to conjugation. There's only C1, C2, C3, and S3. And of these four subgroups, two have trivial core. So there is a, a transposition, there is a, a cyclic group of order two generated by transposition, 
If you intersect with you know, its conjugates, you clearly get just identity. And similarly, there's a trivial group itself. Uh, so these two subgroups, that these are two different subgroups of the conjugation, they define two different uh, faithful transitive actions on different number of points. So the number of points is the index of the subgroup in G. Uh, so this group S3 occurs twice in our classification of transitive groups. It occurs as a group 3T2, in other words, second transitive group on three letters. This is the usual action on three of S3 on three points where the stabilizer is a transposition. Uh, and also, as I said, every group has also a regular action. S3 is no exception. So it can act on six points, namely on the group itself, if you want, by left multiplication. Uh, and this is called uh, 6T2 in the classification of transitive groups. So uh, every group uh, may occur several different times. Uh, and the number of times it occurs is the number of these core free subgroups of G up to conjugation. Now, this is maybe sort of looks like a bit kind of abstract uh, mumbo jumbo sort of group theory, but from point of view of Galois theory, this is a very uh, sort of like clear what, why this happens. Uh, I'm sure you've observed before that sometimes in Galois theory, you, have, you can have inside a given Galois extensions, you have different fields which have exactly the same Galois closure. So let me do my S3 example here. Let's take a random uh, S3 extension. So what I took here is a splitting field of X to the six plus three. Uh, alternatively, it's the same as a splitting field of X cubed minus three. Yeah, let's, let's think of it this, of this, in this way. So let's take a polynomial X cubed minus three over Q. So what are its roots? Uh, there's a cube root of three, uh, and there's a cube root of three multiplied by various third roots of unity. So the normal, the splitting field is this extension here, Q adjoins zeta three, Q root of three. Uh, and this is an S3 extension of Q. Now, uh, it is a Galois, and you can see this field uh, in two different ways. You can see it as a normal closure uh, of, of this field here. In other words, as a splitting field of this degree three polynomial X Q minus three. But you can also take a primitive element uh, which is quite easy to construct here because uh, this is a joining square root of minus three. This is a joining cube root of minus three. So if you adjoin six root of minus three, you in fact get the whole field. So if you look at the, uh, this polynomial here and you just adjoin its roots, you get the whole thing. If you adjoin even one of its roots. Uh, so this is the polynomial of degree three of which this is splitting field. And this is the polynomial of degree six of which this is splitting field. And, and that's precisely, um, our situation. So the Galois group here, S3, acts on the roots of, he, of this polynomial as what we call 3T2, and it acts on the roots here as what we call 6T2, is a different transitive group. Because this condition to have a field whose Galois closure is the whole, uh, is the whole field, is the whole Galois field that we're considering. Remember, by Galois theory, every field is cut out by a subgroup. So this condition that the Galois closure of this field is the whole thing and not some smaller normal sub-extension of this field, it exactly corresponds to the fact that this subgroup here has trivial core. In other words, uh, it doesn't have any, it doesn't contain any normal subgroup G. So this is, uh, so sometimes when you think of uh, Galois groups, uh, if you think of them as abstract groups, there is just S3, but if you want to realize them as groups of uh, polynomials, then you have to think a little bit that you can have different actions. And sometimes you can have even different actions on the same number of points. So the same group can occur even you know, twice, for example, uh, in the same degree. So there is a slight distinction. Uh, and a second uh, observation is that uh, some groups, well, somewhat unfortunately, they only have a regular action and nothing else. Because, uh, for example, every subgroup of them uh, of, of G is normal. And this happens if, for instance, G is a billion. So if G is a billion, then it's very easy to see that there are no core free subgroups except for the trivial group. And similarly, there are some interesting other examples, such as generalized quaternion groups. I'm sure you've seen a quaternion group Q8, and it lies in a family Q8, Q16, Q32, and so on, which all have a very similar definition. And these groups also have a property 
that every subgroup of G is normal. Uh, they also don't have any core free subgroups. And that means that uh, this group only acts transitively uh, on um, number of on the order of G points and nothing uh, and nothing less than that. So that means that if you want to realize this group as a, a Galois group of an irreducible polynomial, then this irreducible polynomial has quite a large degree. It must have degree which is equal to the order of G, which is kind of quite unfortunate. It means, for example, that if you want to realize a cyclic group of order, I don't know, 71, then you have to look at polynomials of degree 71. Uh, there's nothing else you can do, really. even though for some other groups, such as symmetric groups, uh, you can realize a group of order and factorial acting on endpoints. So these are kind of two different orderings which people who work in explicit Galois theory have to sort of go between sometimes. Sometimes it's convenient to order groups by their order. Sometimes it's convenient to group to order them by, let's say, the smallest transitive set on which a group acts, and therefore by that transitive ID. So both in GAP and MAGMA, there is what's called a small group database, which orders groups by their order. So you can ask what's a fifth group of order 16, what's a sixth group of order 16, and so on. Uh, and it also has this transitive group database, which I already mentioned. And these are really different. So for example, if you uh, sort groups by their order. Well, I just checked this morning that if you want to get to S6, uh, there is 10 million groups that you have to consider before you get there, because there are so many groups of order 512 and 256 and so on. But if you order groups by their order, then uh, it takes a long, long time to get here. But on the other hand, you know, you cover small cyclic groups quite quickly. On the other hand, if you uh, order them by their transitive uh, by the transitive group identification, then you get to S6 pretty quickly because there are not that many groups, not many, not so many groups in degree four, five, and six. But you'll never get, for example, to cyclic group for the 49 because, as I said, uh, only groups of order up to uh, up to transitive degree 48 have been uh, have been listed. So this is not sort of in any database. So this is a bit. Um, uh, this can is sometimes is a little bit of an issue, but I just wanted to mention that there are two uh, classifications like this. Uh, are there any questions so far? Okay, I'll keep an eye on the chat. Uh, all right, so now let me uh, get sort of to the core of this. You know, one of the biggest unsolved problems in uh, in number theory is uh, what's called inverse Galois problem, and uh, there's a very respectable collection of people who consider this problem interesting, starting from Hilbert and Beat and Noether and Brower and uh, people like that. Uh, and uh, it asks a very natural question, which I mean, it's kind of obvious once you started to really learn Galois theory and you learn about Galois groups as being symmetry groups of uh, roots of polynomials, whether every symmetry group occurs in this way. So there is a uh, conjecture, which is called the inverse Galois problem. There are two versions. There's one over Q and one over Q of T. I'll mention both of them because this will be sort of particularly important for some of the, some of the constructions that we have and also for the package, the magma package that you are invited to play with. So one says that if you have a finite group G, the conjecture says that uh, there is always an extension, a Galois extension Q over Q, which has that group G as a Galois group. And the second says that uh, the same is true over Q of T, except you have to be a little bit careful because you don't want boring sort of constant examples. Otherwise, it will be the same conjecture. If I just said there is an extension of Q of T with a given Galois group, well, then, um, uh, then of course, if you can construct one over Q, you can take the same constant extension over Q of T, which doesn't vary with T uh, at all. So uh, you don't want that. You really want this uh, extension to vary. Uh, and more generally, and as you will see uh, later, this is quite a natural, uh, what's called sort of geometric assumption. You don't want any subfield of this uh, extension to be constant over Q. So that's why there is a word regular here. So the conjecture says that there is a regular, sometimes called geometric, uh, finite Galois extension K over Q of T, which has a given Galois group G. So what this regular means is that uh, one very concise way of stating uh, the definition is that K has no algebraic elements. So the intersection of K and Q bar is equal to Q. There is nothing in K 
Uh, if you take any element, it's always transcendent over, over Q. And it's very easy to see that it's uh, the alternative is to say that uh, there is no subfield uh, inside this uh, large field K, which is constant over Q, except of course Q itself. Uh, now, uh, there's no reason really to stick to one variable T here. You can take N variables T1 up to Tn, and sometimes we'll be interested in such families. So uh, the families of Q T1 up to Tn, uh, which again are defined regularly the same way as having no uh, algebraic elements. And uh, with the exception that, uh, especially with a magma package in the examples I'll give, uh, I won't call variables T1 up to Tn, but I'll call them A, B, and so on, just by the usual letters, usually not going very far. Just uh, that if you see A and B and so on, this is, you know, these are just variables such as T1 and T2. So uh, let's solve the inverse Galois problem for G equals S3. So uh, what does it mean? We want to uh, prove these two conjectures when G is a symmetric group in three letters. Like, what do you need to do for this? So for the first conjecture, you just need to give one example uh, which has Galois group S3, and this is not very difficult to do. I already gave it on a previous slide. You can take the polynomial X cubed minus three, and by the usual sort of Galois theory yoga, you know, it's Eisenstein, therefore reducible, therefore the, Galois, the order of the Galois group is divisible by three, and it also contains the roots of unity, so it must be the whole thing. And you see that the Galois group is the whole uh, S3, and therefore the inverse Galois problem is true for S3 over Q. I'll use this curly I to denote uh, inverse Galois problem for a given group over Q. Now, if you want to do it over Q of T, and by the way, in practice, this is kind of very nice, but in practice, not very useful. If you play with any sort of number theory, uh, so for instance, you want to study class groups of, I don't know, cubic extensions of Q or anything like this, uh, having one example of a cubic extension uh, is of very limited use. What you'd really would like to have, you would like to have a family. And moreover, you would like to have a family that doesn't have very specific properties like this, which makes it non-regular. So if you look at the family X cubed minus A, so I call it a family because you can think of it as a bunch of uh, cubic extensions, kind of one for every A over Q. So you can think it, uh, of it's either a field extension of Q of T or Q of A, if you call the variable A, or you can think of it as a family of extensions uh, over Q, and that's why uh, I'm going to call such a thing usually a family over QA. And this is an example of a non-regular family, or if you want a non-regular extension, because the splitting field of this polynomial contains Q zeta three, and zeta three is algebraic over Q. Or in other words, uh, if you want uh, in this tower that I had before, when you have an S3 extension uh, and it has, uh, a quadratic extension over it, um, uh, this quadratic extension does not vary with, um, does not vary with T, or does not vary with A, it's completely constant. While on the other hand, if you take more or less any other example, so uh, you take X cubed plus some polynomial in A times X plus some polynomial uh, in A, in other words, you take a more or less generic looking cubic polynomial whose coefficients depend on A, and it's most likely to define a regular family. So here, for instance, if you take X cubed plus X plus A, um, uh, then this is a regular family. And how do you see this? Well, in this case, the quadratic extension, which it contains, as you probably know, if you have a cubic uh, field like this and you want to see which quadratic it contains in its Galois closure, you have to compute its discriminant. The discriminant of this by the fa famous sort of 4a cubed plus 27b squared formula, in this case is this, minus 27a squared minus four. So uh, this field varies with a, it's not a constant extension of q, and it's a nice exercise to deduce from here that in fact, uh, the whole family is regular. So it can't have any other constant uh, subfields. And therefore, if you wish, just this particular family uh, proves the fact that the inverse Galois problem is true for S3 over QA. In this, so whenever I talk about inverse Galois problem over fields such as QA, I always mean that I want the word regular in there. Uh, I see that there's a question whether such a field is unique. No, certainly not. We don't expect any sort of uniqueness here. 
in a sense that, for instance, if you say I want to have quadratic extensions of Q, there's lots of them, Q2, Q3, Q5, and so on. And similarly, if you look at quadratic extensions of Q of T, then you take any rational function in T, you join its square root, and you get a different extension of Q of T, unless your two functions differ by a square. So uh, there is lots of them. There is, and I may mention it, some sort of search sometimes for what's called generic families, which is kind of one family, possibly in many variables, such that any extension that you can think of, it's always its specialization. But this is a very difficult problem, except for like very small groups to find such things. And I will not talk probably very much about that. Okay, so now uh, before kind of going on and sticking to only these two fields, Q and Q of T completely, let me just say a few words what happens if you do change them, because you can ask yourself, well, you ask this question of the Q of Q of T, what if you ask uh, it over a different field, a different base field, uh, and it is, uh, there are some famous examples where uh, this question is, uh, is known uh, to be trivially false uh, or known to be true, or like in the case of Q of a number field, is really sort of the most interesting case for which we don't know the answer. So let's look at it very briefly. Well, first of all, if you start with, I mean, it's clear that this um, inverse Galois problem, it cannot have a positive answer over any field, because if you take, for example, an algebraically closed field, well, it doesn't have any finite extensions at all. So if you ask, does it have any, I don't know, A5 extensions, of course, the answer is no. So if you take K, for instance, to be R or C, well, in this case, every extension of K has degree at most two, if you took R or just trivial, if you took C. So apart from C1 and C2, uh, these little cyclic groups, you can't realize any, uh, anything as a Galois group. So the inverse Galois problem is trivially false. And there are some other examples where it is also false. For example, if you take a finite field, then every extension of a finite field is always cyclic. So apart from cyclic groups, which you can realize, um, no other group is realizable as a Galois group or FQ. And similarly, uh, over archaic fields, every extension of Q is soluble. So again, if you ask yourself, well, does Q3 have A5 extensions? Then again, well, the answer is no, because it's not a soluble group. It's an interesting question, which soluble groups you can realize over a given periodic field. But at least it is clear that, um, so the problem, which Galois groups you could possibly have, it certainly still has substance. But it's certainly true that you don't expect an arbitrary Galois group to be there. But interestingly, there are examples of fields where we do know the inverse Galois problem to be true. So over C of T, uh, it's essentially a consequence of Riemann's existence theorem uh, that you can construct, well, a Riemann surface which has a, any given Galois group on P1. And in terms of fields, it means that uh, the field C of T uh, has extensions with any Galois group. It's descending into Q. Which is, uh, which is a problem. And similarly, there is a sort of difficult theorem by Harbater, which says that the same is true if you replace C by QP. So uh, over QP of T, again, you can realize any group as a Galois group. So the most interesting case is the case when K is Q or uh, more generally a number field, but Q is difficult enough. Uh, it is generally expected uh, that the inverse Galois problems of these conjectures are true. So in other words, any group, you can realize the Galois group of Q or any number field. And similarly, as a regular extension of uh, Q of T, I don't know if in the case of Q of T or K of T, where K is a number field, if anyone has stated this as a conjecture in many questions, many books like Sarah's Topics and Galois Theory, for example, is a bit more carefully phrased as a question because we're not completely certain that we have enough evidence for that, but I think most people um, uh, most people believe that, um, that this is true. Yeah. Uh, is there a result for K of T where K is an arbitrary algebraically closed field? Well, I think in characteristic zero by sort of Lefschetz principle sort of nonsense, it's probably the same as over the, uh, over the complex number. So it's probably the same as this question. Um, in positive characteristic, um, I actually do not know. Um, there are certainly results from over FP of T, which if I remember correctly, they follow from Harbater's theorem, but whether they just say you can always do it, or there are some 
uh, issues because of separability and things like this, I don't quite remember. So uh, it's a very good question, but I don't, I, I don't know. Uh, over FQ of T, I'm pretty sure it's not, it's not known. Um, and well, this sort of being an explicit methods and number theory course, uh, what I would also like to, to do, I'd like to do two things. Well, first of all, just to review some of the many methods that we have, they're really, I mean, it's an interesting problem because there are many methods and many of them, they look completely disjoint. So some use like, very difficult uh, group theory coming from braid groups and things like this. Some use um, very advanced number theory, some uh, rely more on uh, algebraic geometry uh, and some just sort of on ad hoc constructions and, and many of them, they, they're able to do sort of, to construct many groups, but there is no universal picture in some sense, and none of the methods seem to in some sense work generically. So I'm just going to review some of them in these lectures. Uh, and also because this is really a workshop on explicit uh, version, if you want, of number theory, we will be very interested in the question, uh, which is the explicit version of this um, in the Zgala problems how to construct this field k in the case where you expect the answer to be yes, which is uh, already, as many people have discovered, it's an even much more difficult problem than proving theoretical results that such extensions exist and many results that we have are non-constructive. Um, so this is basically what's going to be the focus of this course. Okay, so let me give you a very, very brief history. So uh, I think, it's kind of generally accepted from what I understand that this whole study started with uh, Hilbert, who has a very influential paper where he proves what is now known as Hilbert reducibility theorem, where he proves in particular that if you can solve the second conjecture for a given group G, then it implies uh, the first one. So in other words, if you can realize uh, G as a Galois group of Q of T, even without the word regular, then it implies that you can also realize it over Q. Uh, and in the same paper, he proves that um, groups such as SN, uh, you can realize regularly if you wish uh, over Q of T, uh, and also a very interesting example, which are alternating groups AN, and his constructions are explicit. And I will review briefly of uh, what's going on there because it's one of the general techniques that we have. Uh, secondly, uh, for soluble groups, uh, this is a very famous story of Shapirovich's theorem. So there is a result uh, going back to 1937 by Schultz and Reichardt, who proved that odd nilpotent groups are realizable uh, as Galois groups of Q. It's a basically an inductive construction, but as I'll explain later, it's difficult to set it up in a way that it works. Uh, and it only works for groups of uh, odd order. And uh, this was with some gaps which were lately fixed, um, extended to all soluble groups by Shafarevich in 1989. So we now have a sort of clean proof of, uh, uh, that every soluble group is a Galois group over Q, but it does not extend to Q of T. So over Q of T, this remains a conjecture that every soluble group can be realized as a, a Galois group of a regular extension of Q of T, even for L groups, so for groups of um, prime power order, and some of the smallest examples are, there are three groups of order 64 for which um, this, this conjecture is not known of Q of T. And secondly, this proof is actually non-constructive. So it doesn't give you uh, a specific extension uh, uh, in the end. Now on a completely opposite side of the spectrum, there are some soluble groups. There is a, a famous method which is called rigidity, which has been uh, applied to simple groups, and it mostly applies only to simple groups. There are many authors associated to it, for Sheikh, for groups such as PSL, and then Male, Matsat, Belly, and Thompson, uh, looking at a lot of sporadic groups. Um, and uh, using this method, a lot of simple groups are known to be Galois groups of Q and even Q of T. And sometimes these methods can be made explicit, really. Uh, and for example, all sporadic groups except M23 are known to be Galois groups of Q of T, even a monster group, which is so large, we probably still don't know its character table fully, but we do know that this group is realizable as a Galois group of Q of T, uh, remarkably enough. So this is a very interesting method, but it's, it has only very limited applications. Uh, and 
uh, if you order the groups by their transitive degree, which if you want is a natural way to go about things if you're interested in, you know, Galois groups of polynomials, reducible polynomials of degree two, three, four, and so on, then uh, there is a um, theorem that all uh, transitive groups of degree uh, less than or equal to 15 are Galois groups over Q of T. Uh, and I have a constructive version of the theorem in the sense that I have also now families uh, in the same degrees. And basically in this course, I'd like to present some of the methods which, you know, which makes these sort of things possible. So we do know uh, the inverse Galois problem for all Galois groups, for all groups which you know, act transitively on sets of with the most hitting elements. Uh, and of course, uh, a lot of people have collected a lot of data uh, over Q and over Q of T. And let me just mention a few uh, results here. There's Jones and Roberts database of number fields that's made by Smith, who looks at families over Q and over Q of T. And there are big databases, more by Kluners and Mahler, which is now, I was told, is in, in Paris uh, and in LMFDB, which collects lots and lots and lots of fields, especially over Q, uh, with, with, with specific gamma groups. Okay, so now uh, let me start by saying a little bit about um, the general methods that we have, starting with Hilbert and his irreducibility theorem. So uh, there are various versions of this result. Uh, let me start with the simplest one, which is kind of easiest to understand. It says, suppose you have a polynomial, uh, in, if you wish two variables, t and x, which have slightly different role. So uh, we view it as a polynomial over the field qt, but with a variable x. So it's a polynomial of the D, let's say, in the variable X, but its coefficients depend on T. And what we would like to do, we would like to specialize this coefficient, so it's called Hilbert's specialization theorem, by taking a random rational number R and substituting it in place for T. Then you get a polynomial, and generically, of course, the degree will not drop. So it will be a polynomial still of the same degree. And the question is, uh, is it true that if you start with an irreducible polynomial over Q of T, it remains irreducible uh, at least sometimes when you specialize them, when you specialize it. And Hilbert's irreducibility theorem says that this is true. And in fact, for infinitely many uh, rational numbers R and Q, this specialization is going to have the full degree and it's going to be irreducible. In fact, there are, there's a lot of sort of study uh, the set of exceptions and the study of so-called thin sets uh, when, you know, how often this polynomial is irreducible. And it makes sense to say that for most R, you can quantify this, uh, this polynomial uh, is going to be irreducible, even though you have to be a bit careful here. And there is a more general version. You can replace one polynomial by a collection of N polynomials. You can replace one variable T by M variables, T1 up to Tm and X is similarly by N variables, X1 up to Xn. So there is a capital N, M and N, which are all equal to one in this particular version, which um, says, you know, exactly the same. You have a bunch of polynomials and they are irreducible. Then there are infinitely many specializations, T1 equals R1 and so on, Tm equals Rm, such as the resulting polynomials in N variables are all irreducible. But this uh, more general version, uh, just is formally implied by this version here. So it is, it is not in some sense sort of more interesting. Of course, in practice, you do want to use it. And uh, so Hilbert proved this theorem over Q and nowadays fields over which uh, this theorem is true, um, let's say the first version, because as I said, the second one is implied by the first one, uh, they're called Hilbertian fields. And examples are rational numbers, number fields, uh, field of rational functions over Q on number fields. And there are some other interesting examples, for example, maximal abelian extension of Q and more generally maximal abelian extension of every number field are known to be Hilbertian. So they still have the, uh, the same properties here. But it's not true for every field. And here is an example uh, where you can immediately see that it's not true, let's say for a finite field FQ, because you can take a family of, let's say C2 cross C2 extensions uh, which I take here from, uh, from the package that I advertised on my first slide. So uh, if you take a polynomial x to the four plus tx squared plus one, it gives a family of C2 cross C2 extensions uh, over, uh, over Q. And in fact, um, 
Um, yeah, so I'm, yeah, exactly. So this is a good question. I'm exactly answering this. So no, there are no finite Hilbertian fields. Uh, well, okay, I think in such a field, 90% of possible are given rise to real numbers. Um, yeah, I don't know about 90%. Uh, this, uh, I'll, have to, I'll have to think about it, but certainly uh, what is true is that finite fields are, are cannot possibly be Hilbertian. There are always polynomials such as this one, for example, um, such that because it has Galois group C2 or cross C2 over FQ of T, if you were to specialize it, it can't give a, a Galois group C2 over C2 across C2 over FQ because FQ doesn't have C2 plus C2 extensions. Here, remember, it has only quadratic extensions. And from here, it's immediate that this polynomial will automatically be reducible. So every specialization of this with T is an FQ will always be reducible. And uh, it is not difficult to deduce from this uh, irreducibility theorem just by taking a primitive element in your field and asking, uh, let's look at its minimal polynomial and asking whether it stays irreducible. Well, if it does, then the Galois group has to stay the same. So it's not very difficult to prove this corollary is that if you can realize the group G as a Galois group with a QT1 TM, then uh, by specializing TIs, so by choosing a specialization for the T1 and then for T2 and for TM carefully, you can make sure that uh, such specializations give you a Galois group over Q. And this most, what I'm talking about here is, for example, implies that um, as a risky dense subset of these TIs will give you specializations, which give the full Galois group of Q. There's, there's more than you can say. So in other words, um, we have sort of one implication and a little bit more than that, if you uh, know inverse Galois problem for G over Q of T in its regular incarnation, so remember this stands for uh, being able to construct a regular family for G over Q of T, then by this Hilbert specialization thing, uh, you get uh, G as a Galois group over Q. But moreover, because remember regular family has a property, it doesn't have any algebraic elements in it. So you can base change it to any other number field and it stays regular with the same Galois group. So if this is a regular family, then it gives you a regular family over K for any number field K. That's why it's amazing to be able to have regular families. That's why it's such a very good notion. So uh, therefore uh, this conjecture implies the corresponding conjecture for G over K for any number field K immediately. So in other words, if you can construct one regular family over Q of T, such as we did for S3 uh, on the previous slide, then suddenly you know that every single number field has infinitely many S3 extensions. So it's a very, very powerful result. And for some constructions such as wreath products and so on, similarly, you really need this notion of regular. Okay, let me see if I can do something in my remaining minute. Uh, yes, so let me just uh, put it like this. So as a corollary of this result, Hilbert showed that SN is a Galois group of Q uh, for, ev uh, of, for every n uh, greater or equal to one. In other words, this inverse Galois problem for SN over Q. And the proof is, you may have seen this in the course of Galois theory, uh, it uses uh, this rational function fields. So you first realize SN over a rational function field with n variables. So you start with n indeterminants, alpha one up to alpha n, which you think of the roots of some abstract polynomial, but they're just variables. Sn acts on them by permutation. So in other words, Sn acts on this field, q adjoin alpha one up to alpha n. It's the field in n variables, and Sn just acts by permuting the variables. Now, and then you hear it with Galois theory. You say, well, I have a finite group of automorphisms in the field, which fixes q. So let's look at the field of invariants. And the field of invariance, there's a famous result in this case, is, uh, so K fixed by SN in this case, is a field of elementary symmetric functions in the roots. So it's again, uh, a field in N variables where these N variables are now different. They are not alpha one up to alpha N, they're A one up to AN, where the AI are elementary symmetric functions in the alpha. For example, the sum of the roots, dot, 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 the product of the roots, these are the functions which are invariant under G, that's quite clear, but more importantly, every other rational function which is invariant under G 
that can be expressed in terms of them. So in this case, this field of invariance, little k, is again, uh, like the field you started with, a purely transcendental extension of q. And that means that we have just realized Sn as a Galois group over q uh, a1 up to an, over this such a purely transcendental extension. And by Hilbert's irreducibility theorem, you can now specialize these AIs in such a way as to get G over K. Okay, I think uh, there is an answer to a question that if K is algebraically closed, then every finite group is a Galois group of K of T. Yeah, thank you. So for example, over FQ bar of T, this statement is true uh, and it is used hard beta. It does use hard beta somewhere along the way. Okay, and finally to end with, um, there is Hilbert in the same paper. He also proves that alternating groups A n is a uh, are Galois groups over Q for every n greater or equal to one. And in his time, I think this is very difficult to prove. But in our times, uh, this is a bit easier. So I did leave it as an exercise, even though it's broken into steps um, uh, on the home page. Okay, I think it's a it's a good place to stop here. So I guess I will see you tomorrow. Okay, let's thank Tim for that beautiful lecture.